at the time, I was kind of diving into this subject of being left behind and what that means. My uncle had just passed away. I was interested in, in what people did to pay tribute or to close a death for themselves. And the Stanwood Barn was the only thing that I could think of uh, that was interesting enough and different to meditate on. And that's really what that video was. It was a meditation on a, a sacred place. People who have no connection with the barn could only see it from uh, the south or north side. And the diptych structure of the video, I wanted to create kind of a dimension of the barn. Maybe so they could understand its scale. Also, there are a lot of profound things in that barn that are said. You are alive and you know it walk loudly, there is no tomorrow, really important parts of the barn that said far more to me as an artist than the names on the front of it. I felt like it was a duty of mine as an artist to document all of those things. And I wanted to give people an opportunity to see the inside and other parts of the barn. I don't think people often think about words and how powerful they are. What does it mean when I paint these things onto this barn? It's permanent, you know, unless you paint over it, of course, but for the time being, it's permanent. What does that mean? This blog is dated Wednesday, August 8, 2012. You could call Stanwood a small town. According to the census, our population is just 6,231. Most small towns like traditions, you know, parades and car shows and soapbox derbies and decorating the water tower for holidays. These things bring people together, and Stanwood has them all. We have another tradition, too. It's not planned by the city or a volunteer committee, but it affects the whole community. You might call it the morning barn. It stands just outside of town on Marine Drive. It hasn't sheltered animals for years. Sometime in the last 20 or 30 years, it became a place for high school seniors to paint their names in their graduation year. I'm told that the farmer didn't take kindly to this tradition at first, but as time passed, the barn has become something of a community reader board, and the farmer now offers no resistance. Life is real in Stanwood, and not everyone makes it to graduation. Sometimes kids die. Just in the last few years, we've lost teens to sickness, to accidents, and to violence. When that happens, their friends gather at the barn with paint and a plan. They prop up their ladders and turn the north wall of the barn into a memorial for their friend. It gives them a way to deal with their grief, to support one another, and to keep their friend's memory alive. We've watched the barn go through many changes in our years living in Stanwood. I've cried to see the name of another young person whose life was just too short. Earlier this year, a seven-year-old girl was accidentally shot by her younger brother. She was rushed to the hospital, but she did not survive. The barn became a huge yellow canvas with her name, Jenna, written across the wall in lavender. And now the barn has a new look. A young mom in Stanwood, Jen Bell Burgess, was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of cancer. After a violent 18-month struggle, she passed away on July 26th. I drove by the barn last Wednesday afternoon, the day after Jen's service, and I saw a group of kids gathered to paint the barn. It was Jen's 15-year-old daughter, Haley, and her friends pouring themselves into a healing project. No longer just for teens, the morning barn is now opening its doors to the entire community reminding us of those among us that we have loved and lost. 
Whoever would have dreamed that a barn could offer such comfort? I'm a blogging mama, I guess. Things about my life, things that interest me, things that I come across that seem interesting and people would enjoy. I like to do photography. My husband does photography, and we put some of those pictures on, too. I was thinking that the time that I stopped was when the girls were painting the barn for Jen Bell Burgess. But I had stopped before just to take pictures because it was so, uh, I mean, it was just such a marvelous place, and it changed, you know, and it, it was just a great place to see the community spirit, to, to sense the heartbeat of our town. I happened to be driving back from Warm Beach just about the time the girls had really gotten going. And I, my eyes popped open. I said, I'm going home for my camera. And I took my camera and I, um, I clomped around there. I went into the barn. I, I was so surprised to see all the painting in the barn. It was such an amazing place. It was just a riot of colors and sign painted on sign painted on sign. There was some junk, you know, there was garbage, there were holes in the floor. You wanted to be real careful. And I think I probably shouldn't have even been in the barn. But it was, um, it was life. It was layers of life. It was like an archaeological dig in that barn. And I um, walked around the barn and I asked, you know, is it all right if I take some pictures? And um, I found out which girl was Haley and I asked her. And she said, yes, I could take pictures. It was really wonderful to be able to get these girls in the process of, you know, it was a grieving healing process for them. There had been a picnic, but they didn't go to the picnic. They went to paint the barn. They needed to do something. They needed to support Haley, who probably didn't want to be with all those people who would come to the picnic. She needed to be involved in something that was going to give her some healing. I guess I wanted to to write about the barn because that's part of life here in Stanwood. From, from what I understand, there was a lot of Norwegian and, or Scandinavian immigrants here. This, these immigrant farmers, hard work and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, something has changed in this community. He was always a bachelor all his life. He never married. A quiet, uh, he was very sensitive to anybody that they want, he doesn't want to, didn't want to cheat anybody. And I think people took advantage of him on that. The Jurgensons had a farm down there, a dairy farm, and uh, they, that, their, that farm was been, my grandfather built that barn years ago. And then Herman, after they divided up his father's estate, he got that part where the barn is, and he built that barn. I don't know just why he built that barn, but he built it. Some of it, the, they tore down an old house that was on the property further south of it. They tore it down probably in the early 30s, very early 30s. They tore down the building and used, they used the lumber. That was really good lumber. You didn't find really a knot in it. I guess that was about six or seven years old, I remember it, 36, 37. I was in there, saw him sometimes, he was building on it. He did it in about a year, or less than a year, maybe. I think he painted it himself. I don't think he hired any help to, on it. Really, it was kind of a useless barn because it was too small for anything. It didn't even have a concrete floor and it didn't have any concrete foundation under it. They used it for their heifers. He liked it when they when we put hay in there and, and we used it. And then they got too old to farm, they sold out part of the place. And so then uh, my stepson and his wife took it over. Oh, that was in the in the sixties, I think. Somebody's name, I think it was some guy was killed in some accident. And he, his name was put on there, and I think that's what started it. Quite a few cars. Some people got caught on the railroad track and got hurt. I don't know whose, whose name it was, but I remember there was a name on it, and there were different 
signs on the, the different graffitis on it. I don't remember what it was, but uh, they didn't even come and ask for permission. So that's why we, we had to resent it. I know I would have been mad if it was my, my barn. I don't remember whether my uncle tried to stop it or not, stop it or not. And yeah, I kind of let it go. I, uh, I didn't pay much attention to the barn. I was just hoping to get rid of it. I don't know why they wanted to memorialize those people that way. To me, it just doesn't make any sense. It's always classmates that paint the barns, or friends, you know, best friends. It was basically just their name, and they'd put, you know, rest in peace, or, you know, they'd make, like, bleeding hearts, or... It's always something to do with the person, you know, something about their personality, or... Mostly just names, but they'd usually p personalize something, you know, live on, or write on, or... They didn't use a barn just to write graffiti, like you write on a wall or whatever, gang names or anything. It was always a symbol of something or somebody. So it wasn't a nuisance. It wasn't an eyesore or anything, you know. Everything they painted on there was always tastefully done. I can't remember exactly when the paintings began, but I've driven that road or ridden on that road from Warren Beach to Stanwood since I was in fourth grade or younger. So for years and years, um, as we've come up to camp or, you know, been here to visit friends or something, I've been on that road. And every time I drive by, I would just notice whose name was up there. Boy, my first recollection of the barn goes way back. We weren't given necessarily complete reign or freedom over the area beats we chose to work in. But as I had opportunities, I would always work in Stanwood. And very candidly, there was always good coffee to be had in Stanwood. And so very often I would drive up Marine Drive and and so, you know, the barn's kind of just always been one of those stables that you used to kind of expect to see. The kids would try to paint it every year when they graduated from high school. That's what I first remember. I was not conscious of people's names at the beginning when I saw it. I mostly saw uh, big uh, expressions of their high school class. 99 rules, something like that. One year, I think the kids had... Um, they put different sayings, and I don't know why I remember one of them, but it was Have Gun, Will Travel, which was after a TV show. I think my son's class was uh, the boys of 99 or something. I think my daughter's class just did their, they weren't as um, creative as the others. <laughs> they just did a white barn with a red 2007. You know, I think it depends on what happens every year. Every year is different. Really, my earliest memory of the barn was as a reporter, because I uh, we didn't live out in Warm Beach like we do at, at this time, where we went by the barn you know, every day. But, but it was as a reporter, and it was somebody that had died, and somebody called me and said they're painting the barn. And many times that's how we would find out, is that they had paint cans and ladders and so forth out there. And I think a cemetery, you know, that sits there and sits there, and, and um, it... it it, nothing happens for months and months and sometimes years, and then there's a flurry of activity. It, it just, that's the way it was with the barn. It would, some names would stay on there for more than a year, sometimes even more, um, and then sometimes only a week. Then all of a sudden it became the, the place to go, to grieve, to mourn, and it took on its own life, and that in itself is a, is a real eye-opener that uh, why are so many kids dying up there? You know, somebody so young shouldn't, shouldn't be dying, you know, and that kind of was, I think, a jarring thing to a lot of people, um, which then allowed for a lot of people to, to grab onto. And when you have a barn in the middle of a large field, that's all by itself. It's kind of an obvious and easy place to really make a, a nice statement for everybody who's coming and going into Stanwood from the the south side. When I, where I went to high school, we had a bridge, a railroad bridge that we would have to hang off of to paint it. And 
it was always the cannon fodder for other rival high schools that we would paint it and then they would come and paint it. And I honestly, when I look back at my first impressions of the barn, that's kind of what I saw. I saw uh, a rock or a bridge or a place for high school students to, to mark their territory. You know, I'm the graduating class of 95, woohoo. I don't know that I could sit here and tell you that I remember a specific time that, you know, there was more memorials than there were graduations. As my daughters got involved in high school and were out there helping paint the barn, you know, I knew a lot more of the stories. So, uh, you know, maybe it just turns out that uh, expressing grief or anger or something like that is a much more uh, boiling emotion that needs to be expressed than I like my class because that's pretty boring even to me. My name is Jack Gunter. I live on Camano Island. I have been a Stanwood Camano uh, character probably since 1984. I'm very invested in the history of the region. I'm a big history fan of the region and the area, and I'm a history fan of what happened before uh, Europeans came here. And uh, I'm also a fan of public art, and I've made a huge mural in Stanwood. So I'm quite aware of stuff that gets painted on walls. I don't think defining it as art is a relevant place to spend your time worrying about. It. That's like they say that things aren't antiques unless they're 100 years old. And there's a little rule that says it's not an antique unless it's 100 years old. Some of the most important objects ever made are 80 years old by Frank Lloyd Wright or by they're 60 years old by Charles and Ray Eames. You know... The value of something is the genius that goes into it, not how it's defined. There's no box to put antiques in. There's no box to put art in, really. I was approached by a group of a couple of citizens, and they said, we are going to paint that barn over and make it nice and pretty and white again, and we are going, and we want you to get behind us, Jack, because we think that's an eyesore. And I said, uh-uh. I want no part of making a comment on someone else's art and it's none of my business and it's trespassing. All of those things are uh, something I want no part of. The thing about art is art is what teaches us about a community or a group of people long after the community and the gr group of people have moved on and are gone. If you're an outsider and you want to learn something, you, you look at art. All through history, that's how it happens. And of course, was such a heavy time for all of us, and um, having that barn painted uh, to memorialize 3,000 lives lost, and that it touched our community, that it came, you know, some 3,000 miles to, you know, right here in our community, and and it was on that barn for a long, long time. For us that lived out south of Stanwood, 
we were reminded of that every, every morning and every night and every in-between trip. It seemed like it was there for a while at least. On the side, that was on the one, the one face, on the side there would be declarations of love or different, different smaller notations at different times, but that flag was prominent. It was, it was done really well, by the way, but the flag stood for a long time. And then one day the whole thing was repainted and they started over. And the next person that I remember to go on the barn, and this could be wrong. I, my, I've learned that my mind plays tricks on me um, in terms of things that have happened over the years. But I remember when Dana Furry was murdered. She didn't show up at school, and so her friends were all calling, and then she didn't show up for work, and her job was calling, and that's just not, wasn't her, you know. And her car was here, and Ben just thought that she was with one of her friends or something, and I kept calling him and saying, have you seen Dana, have you heard from Dana? No. So anyway, I asked him to go and check on, check in her room or something, and then that's when he found her, was in there. She was, he was, she had been here a couple hours before he even knew that she was here. I was at the cemetery. It was my dad's birthday that day, so I was at the cemetery putting flowers on the... My mom and I were out there putting flowers on the grave, and then um, we walked back in, and that's when I got the call from Danielle. Danielle kept trying to call, to trying to track her down, too. That was her sister. So Danielle called and was screaming, and I couldn't understand a word she was saying. So that's how I found out. It was, I want to say it was the Monday after the prom, and kids were looking at pictures. It might have been a week after the prom, but it was a Monday. And I was subbing in a class that, and Dana wasn't in class that day. And so, you know, she was marked absent. We didn't think much about it. And then I was at, my son was a baseball player, and he was on the varsity baseball team, and we were at a baseball game at the high school and sitting in the bleachers. And one of my students turned around and told me, just turned around and said, Dana was murdered. And I said, of course, Dana who? Because obviously nobody we knew, right? I mean, we're living with Stanwood, right? And so that's how I heard about it. That's how I heard about Dana dying. Because, you know, everybody knew her and everybody knew of her and this small town, you know, murder those kids that were sitting around and the shock that was going through, just a ripple, because it was just when they started hearing what had happened. Um, you know, it's probably four o'clock that day. And so the, the crowd of kids, you could just feel it deflate and just a, a numbness going over it, over the whole crowd. Remember when that happened? That's one of the first times I think that um, it was really difficult to continue to cover that and to keep uh, myself from getting emotional as well. Uh, and when they painted that barn, um, it was everyone, everyone was crying and myself included, you know, it was just a very emotional time that, that it happened the way it did, it's so scary. That was, that was really the, the first time that it seemed to really sink in, that the kids were using it to get over their grief. She was such a beautiful girl, smart, had such a, um, a life ahead of her of nothing but wonderful. And then to have her life extinguished so quickly in such a, an awful way that um, I, I do think that it helped, some, helped the community a little bit keep her with us a little bit longer. My son uh, just finished school last year, and I have one left in school. She's a junior. She was five when Dana was killed. She doesn't even remember her. And it was like everybody thought that she was 
Dana's child, because they were always together, you know. The the Daniel and Dana would take the little kids with them to cross country practice, and they were like their little mascots. So yeah, but yeah, she doesn't remember her. It became a tradition. It became a ritual. When we lost a young person, the friends got together in Stanwood. Stanwood kids are unique in that they float the river. They have bonfires. They, they come together. And that was another part of their tradition, their ritualistic whatever you want to call it, whatever they would do. So I, I think that they saw that as just what you did. I'm not sure which year it was, how long after Dana died. I think it was a year or two after Dana died. We went through a period of time at Stanwood High School where there were four or five deaths. And it seems like they've been coming more often uh, since in the last few years. As a mom, during that time when when my boys were in high school and the names kept popping up on the wall at the barn, it was pretty distressing to realize that we were losing so many of our young people. And it seemed to me to be an inordinate number. Uh, the 2005-2006 school year, I had a class that they had put together in the summer of students who were brand new to the district, and they'd come from all over the East Coast, Midwest, and all over. And they, this particular year, it was like, you know, we were having somebody die every two months. And they actually were scared. And one day we did talk about the fact that they had transferred to Stanwood and they wondered what kind of school that they'd come to. The barn had just been painted. And my son's good friend, Sam Wilson, when, when Sam died, they they made a that group of friends made a conscious effort. We aren't we aren't we can't paint over that name. It's we can't do that. That was out of respect. And that's when they painted the water tower for Sam. And you don't see that kind of respect out of high, young high school kids very often. But they respected that spot. They respected that space. So when Sam died so quickly after J Justin Stump died, the seniors wouldn't let the sophomores put. Sam's name on the barn and so they painted Sam's name on the on a water tower on the way outside of um, town on the way to Mount Vernon and Sam's st name is still on there um, it's on private property and I think it's kind of hard to jump the fence that's there but um, I always thought that that was that was interesting When we lose a student, we have to go in crisis mode. We have to protect our kids, so we come together. But when, when it's a student that's, or a young adult that's no longer a student at the high school, we aren't necessarily the first to hear about it. So then we'd see the painting on the barn, and it, it was, it, you always felt that we lost somebody. Robbie Holly, when he died, he had graduated a number of years before. Um, but his friends did what our kids would do, and they went to the barn and they painted.
I always wondered about the person who owned the barn and what he or she thought about the barn. I don't know if the kids in general thought about whose barn is this? You know, it was just like, this belongs to Stanwood, so it's my turn now. When my oldest daughter, who was the senior class president, said, hey, we're going to go paint the barn, um, <laughs> we had to have a conversation about that, obviously. My feeling, right, wrong, or indifferent, is that the community and the property owner saw that barn as meaning. The police had chosen, for the most part, to look the other way um, on that trespassing because they knew that it was also serving a purpose uh, and because it's caught kind of in between a, a couple of different jurisdictions too. Despite the fact that it's illegal, my feeling was that everybody wanted that barn to mean what it meant. Well, certainly there was never any actual person who came into my office or called 911 and said, you know, get out here and get these trespassers off the property. I did have a friend who lived across the street from the barn and every year when the kids would start their their painting of it to commemorate their year she would hear them in the middle of the night and a couple of times she called the police and the police sort of looked away but then at the same time they wanted to make sure the kids were safe it's a private property <laughs> and i really found that interesting that this private property had become a public memorial it had meaning to everyone, um, and it belonged to one person. My name is Alfonso Moreno, and I work in a Mexican restaurant in La Hacienda in Marysville. And I worked there for a long time. I'm a bartender, waiter, cashier, do everything in general. Yeah, I own uh, three, four houses, plus the 10 acres. The 10 acres, I have a one for almost 10 years or more than that, the 2001. I bought the property just for fun, you know, the, everybody liked the property there, just uh, everybody wanted to have fun in the, you know, in the barn, you know, but uh, not really because I want to do something with there. Something, you know, like a garden or something, but I never did it because I was always too busy in the restaurant. In that case, um, Somebody come available there or they want to rent the property and I rent it to them. You know, every year they plant something different all the time. But it's always they've been, they use in the property. And before I bought it, yeah, that was painted, uh, you know, but the more when I have it. More when I have it, they started, they, you know, open because they come there when I was there or not there, they, they feel good. They know that they don't do nothing there. You know, we have um, the guy that rented the property for me. He always have uh, things in there and never have a problem at all. Everything fine. He never have a complaint about the kid or never told me anything. No, I was fun. I like it. You know, the people really liked it because a lot of people from another state, they come in here to uh, Stanwood and they come there to paint it. Kid and everybody. And then, you know, I find that they, everybody like it, and I say, okay, why don't do something with this? You know, that's what I was, I was thinking. And that's the reason uh, we give it to the school. Look good, you know what I mean? That they come there and, and they they have a good time there, look like it's a hobby, a really nice hobby. And they paint a lot of time, every day, you know, oh, maybe a week. You don't see nobody there, but almost the time you see somebody painting, doing something there. People like it to do things, you know, they don't have nothing to do at home. Look like they come there to entertain themselves or something, you know. They go like it because they, nobody bothers them. They come there and paint it, entertain themselves. The mind go away, you know, doing things. That's good, you know what I mean?
had him as a junior, and he died when he was a senior. He was one of the nicest kids in my class. Just a sweet, wonderful, quiet, very quiet, but he had a sense of humor too. But the kids would tell me, you know, you think, <laughs> you think Blair is just really quiet, Mrs. Kelly, and he doesn't do anything wrong. And let me tell you, he's really wild. And I would look at him and I would say, Blair, you're, what? And he would just look at me and kind of smile this grin. When I found out that he died, and in fact, I was retired at that point, and I was on a trip down south. I mean, I just was stunned when a friend called me. I just kept thinking about that, and I kept thinking about, should I have called his mother? Should I have, you know, I, I just, I really, I didn't really believe the kids that he um, could be wild and crazy. And so one of the things that taught me, maybe too late, you just never knew those kids that you were teaching unless they'd grown up in your neighborhood. I mean, there were some kids I knew really, really well, <laughs> knew their parents, knew everything about them. But then there were some other kids that could really, um, that were really different than what I saw in the classroom. He was the fourth. The class of 2008 lost four, four boys. Yeah. Yeah. teenager who was in the U.S. Army is dead tonight, and two more teens were hospitalized, the result of a high-speed single-car accident. It happened on 15th Avenue yesterday in a rural area along the Arlington-Stanwood border. Kids tell us there's going to be a memorial here this evening right back there by the flagpole for the young man who died. He did graduate from this school last year or year before last in 2008. And the other kids who were in the car with him, the four others, either attended here in the past or still go to school here. Pam and Jamie Jacobs brought a heart made from flowers to the spot where 19-year-old Mason Derrick lost his life. Derrick was driving yesterday afternoon, speeding along 15th Avenue, according to police, when he lost control of his Acura and veered off the pavement. Detectives say the driver was going 85 miles an hour with four other teenagers in the car. The car went off the road, flipped upside down, and killing the driver. 18-year-old Serena Schuler and Megan Dowis leafed through their Stanwood High School yearbook, remembering one of their own, killed in a car crash Sunday afternoon. He would lighten up a room. Like, I had history with him, and when he would walk in, everyone would just smile, and he was just a really good guy. I don't Bob Walker lives off this narrow road between Arlington and Stanwood. He says 15th Avenue Northeast is not a road to take any chances on. I won't lie, no one goes 35, I didn't go 35, and it's kind of, there's corners all over the place. I mean, I've gone, almost gone off the road a couple times just because they're so narrow and everything. Kathy Vanderberg was outside and witnessed the fatal accident, which also injured four other teenagers in the car. Two are still hospitalized, one in critical condition. He was a very outgoing kind of guy. He kind of liked to show off every now and then. 
he would literally give you his shirt off his back. He was uh, involved with the Army Reserves. He was a fan of Halo 3 at the time. Every time he was near a TV, he's like, do you have Halo 3? <laughs> he's like, if you do, I want to play with you. Cause he was a very competitive player. <laughs> We had about 45 minutes to kill before I had to be at work, so we decided to take a little detour just to kill time. A couple minutes later, we were driving on a very long and narrow road with no shoulder, and there was uh, you know, various dips and bumps in the road. He had a, a glass pipe for marijuana, and he decided to load that up and start smoking. He started speeding faster and faster going down that road and I kept telling him to stop the car and to pull over but there was nowhere to pull over. About a minute or two later my friend Justin who was sitting in the the back seat he reached up and touched Mason's right shoulder with his hand and he told him to to stop the car right now but by that time it was too late we were going 85 miles an hour down the road. We hit a dip in the road and the car took off and hit a tree, which instantly killed my, my best friend Mason through two others, th two of the three kids in the back from the car because they weren't wearing seat belts. After the, uh, the car hit the tree, the car rolled over at least twice to the other side of the road into a telephone pole, which righted the car. But in the process, the roof of the car collapsed, and it uh, gave me uh, very traumatic brain injuries, severed my spinal cord. That is how I became a, a quadriplegic. I could say I regained consciousness at the hospital, but I wasn't really there. I couldn't speak or anything at the time, and my mind was just really blank. And eight and a half months after the accident, I finally, you know, came back to life. And, you know, I started regaining, you know, senses, and I was able to start talking. But... It wasn't until after after that that I heard, you know, what had happened. You know, I kept thinking to myself, you know, how could I have possibly changed the the outcome of the situation that I was in? But in reality, you know, you can't go back and change the past. I had to go, you know, find my own path and figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I do have a purpose in my life, and it's to help others. Putting back the pieces, you know, to try and to try and fix the puzzle, it's it's kind of hard. But after you get some of the pieces together, you tend to know that you, you can't exactly fix the whole puzzle. You just kind of have to. Gather what you can and go from there.
Ellen had been a student in my class, but her best friend was a student in my class also. And before the seniors graduate, I always ask them, they do little, you know, pictures for my wall. And I use those as as motivation for my next group of seniors coming in. Where they're supposed to write where they're going, their favorite quote, and a piece of advice. The year that Ellen died, her friend Cheyenne, her piece of advice was, keep your name off the damn barn. And I still have that on my wall. And every Friday, I tell my students, be good, be safe, have fun, learn something, stay out of jail, and keep your name off the barn. That's all you had to say. Everybody, that's one thing, everybody understood that. Keep your name off the barn. A year after Ellen's death, Leanne and myself and some of the other mothers who had to see their kids' names painted on that barn, painted the word believe on the barn. It was designed by a friend of mine, Nikita. And, and it was done in a way that, from a distance, it looked like be and live. And at that point, in, in some kind of hopeful way, there was a thought that, that we could change the tone, that, that it could be a happy barn. Because when we were painting the barn for, for Ellen and I had ordered pizza, the pizza had come and on the pizza box, it had said the death barn. It would be nice to, to make it the, the, the graduation barn or the wedding barn or the go to prom with me barn. So we painted Believe. It was up there for a good six months. And then Susie Parker passed away from a drug overdose. Statistically, we know we have a significant heroin problem right now. We, we know from, from what our kids are telling us through healthy youth surveys that the school districts conduct, from the, the growth that we see at our needle exchange programs that nonprofits run, that that Snohomish County is in crisis. There's some recent statistics put out by the Snohomish Health District, I think, that back that up. When I was the chief of police here from 2008 to 2012, Stanwood was experiencing what the rest of the, the county and, quite frankly, the rest of the country was experiencing. Heroin is now the number one drug in the Puget Sound and reaching epidemic use across the country. In three months, we have seized 19,244 grams of heroin. High school heroin. A community fights back against the dangerous drug many children are abusing. So many teens are using black tar heroin in one North Sound city. Police call the problem an epidemic. The time I was completely hooked. Like I could, some people start out slowly with other drugs and stuff, but I just did heroin once and I couldn't stop. Abigail Atchison is just 17 years old, a high school dropout and a recovering heroin addict. Stohomish County says Abigail is just one of close to 50 students between the ages of 15 and 17 at Stanwood High School 
that are receiving treatment for heroin addiction. Como Force Michelle Esteban found one student who was expelled from Stanwood High for his heroin habit. Tonight, he's sharing his story. Well, I think about it all the time. I think about wanting to get high. And it's That's like, how addictive heroin is. It's terrible. It's a terrible drug. 19-year-old Billy Primozich says he's been clean for a couple months. He's relapsed twice, but is determined to stop chasing the dragon, the next better high. Don't do it. Nothing good can come out of it. I would give anything. Anything, I would give up everything. To go back in time. Parents and civic leaders believe the increase in heroin use here is due in large part because the drug has become so cheap and readily accessible. Other drugs like Oxycontin, which is very popular among young addicts, has become harder to obtain due to stricter guidelines by the FDA. We, as the police department, we need your help. We need the community's help. You're our eyes and ears. You see what's going on. A community coalition has now been formed, which includes law enforcement, school personnel, and community leaders. But officials here say it still starts with the parents taking an active role in their children's lives. She, she did make new friends. There was an effort to, um, to get her help. Susanna went to rehab when she was 16 the first time. Um, that was hard for us as a family because we found out that she had uh, started dabbling in drugs at such a young age. We didn't realize she was 14 when she started. She did go back into her use she actually went to jail for possession um, and stealing. When she was 18, she went to rehab a second time. And that was when there was a little bit more progress. And when she got out, that was when I noticed a big difference in her and a change in her. And it seemed like, you know, she was, she was gung-ho for being sober. She was proud of it. She wanted to move on with her life. She wanted to become a hairdresser. I mean, she was ready to go as far as like starting her life over. But there was a relapse. That's what the professionals call it. It's pretty angry. Um. I was just watching my sister fall down a, a path of destruction. Um, yeah, I guess if I could do it all over again, I'd be knocking on people's doors, telling them to stay away from my sister. On September 1st, 2011, we got a phone call and um, So I got a call from my mom. I was working that day, and I was sitting and eating dinner, and I just remember my mom telling me to sit down. And I said, okay. So I sat down, and um, she broke the news that I knew I was going to hear, and I feared. And she told me that Susanna's gone. Three weeks before that happened, I remember telling Susanna when she was doing so, so good um, in her progress that I don't want to get that phone call from mom. I remember her joking around, oh, you're not going to get that phone call from mom. So I got that phone call. It was, uh, it was an overdose of heroin. She died after high school about a month after graduation and I was living in Boston, Massachusetts at the time and um, I actually I did shed a few tears that was sad for me so not we weren't we weren't close in high school but um, I, I still would have liked to have been there. Uh, I think it might have been Megan that 
said, all right, uh, we're going to be paying at the barn. Uh, I was like, okay. And so uh, I haven't been out to the barn. All I knew of the barn was, you know, that's where people paint. I started meeting some of Susanna's friends, uh, a couple of random people that came up. And uh, we just started talking about it. Obviously, we knew we wanted to do something, but we didn't know what to do. I was just kind of let my sisters kind of go with it. And, All right, whatever you guys want to do, we'll do it. Um, my sister Charity came up with a, a drawing and an idea and uh, talked about it a little more and all right, let's do it. And so I, I scaled it out and, and placed it on the barn. And then um, we filled in the blanks from there. It was something that was started pretty soon after her passing. They were out there, we have pictures, um, the different stages of her, of the painting of the barn. Our grandchildren were involved and um, many of her friends, it was amazing. It was an expression of love that came, you know, from everybody that knew her, all her friends. I remember it was a sunny day every day when we were painting that barn. And we were joking around, we were throwing paint on each other. Uh, just looking up and seeing her name and all those colors painted on the barn and seeing everyone work together as a group and it's amazing how even in your darkest hour when you come together and you are physically working at something that is all about Susanna or all about that person that you had lost it's um, a very healing experience you know it's just like wow you know we did that, you know, it was, you know, a dozen people. And it's just like, man, I can't, I can't believe we did that. You know, the, op the opportunity to do uh, some sort of art form on, on that scale was, was, was pretty awesome. And then from a distance, you know, it's just like, wow, this is going to make people really happy. I was pretty proud of being able to see that. Susanna had her time, she had her name on the barn, and it's a good, it's kind of like passing a torch over to the next family who has lost a loved one and who's grieving. I had a feeling of gratitude towards the community that they would permit such a thing. They had enough thought and compassion and love, you know, for her and for um, all of those who miss her deeply to let that stay up for a time. Knowing that, you know, God's family would love us and support us in such a way during the hardest time of our life. And um, I'm thankful to have that reminder.
Um, I didn't get to participate in a lot of paintings. The one I did was the story of the police officer who's a kid's found the weapon in his truck and his little girl was killed. It makes me want to cry. Tina Allen is one of many people who live or work near the scene of the shooting, where strangers are now leaving flowers, balloons, and stuffed animals, a tribute to the seven-year-old girl who did not survive. A Marysville police officer, his spouse and children had parked their van yesterday next to the Stanwood City Hall. Investigators say at some point when the children were alone in the vehicle, they found a gun left in the glove compartment. One of the kids picked it up, it went off, killing their seven-year-old daughter, Jenna. We're saying this is an accident. That's not to say that there wasn't some carelessness involved. Certainly there was, or else this would not have taken place. But it does not match up with the gross negligence that's required for the state to prove a crime in this case. It was plain and simple an accident. Derek entered his plea on a manslaughter charge. Not guilty. There are reasonable doubts. There are defenses. He immediately ran to the van um, and saw his daughter who had been sitting in the middle seat of the van uh, slumped over. Didn't even realize when he got out of the van at first that the gun wasn't on him. It was only afterwards that he realized the gun wasn't on me. Where was it? And realized it was in the car. It's not manslaughter. I mean, statements like, you know, it was all his fault. What kind of a dad was he? This is not a momentary lapse in time. It's not a blender. It's not driving down the road and you want to look at what radio station's playing and so you momentarily look away and unfortunately you swerve your car and get in an accident. It's not a case where somebody hands a gun to a young child and says, uh, go have with it, you know, go ahead and have fun, you know, and, you know, just don't hit anybody or something like that. It's not a case like that. The prosecution argues it was one of many poor decisions by Carlisle that ended in the death of his daughter. They say he knew his son had a fascination with guns, that he could get out of his car seat on his own, and Carlisle left an unsecured and loaded weapon in reach of his children. You leave your child in the worst possible place that they could be, the most dangerous situation that they could be in. You leave them there. You know what they want to do. You know what they will do. And you do, and you leave anyway. New at 5.30, the Marysville police officer who left his gun and his kids alone in this van is going back to work this week. Derek Carlisle was fired after his three-year-old son got the gun and killed his seven-year-old daughter. Camera 7's Lee Stoll is live now in Marysville where reaction to the move is mixed. Carlisle was tried for manslaughter and acquitted by a hung jury. Marysville PD fired him, but an arbitrator won his job back last month. I was happy when I heard that. Jack Gunter, the family friend who was talking to the Carlisles at the time of the shooting, testified at his trial. Carlisle called Gunter the day he was rehired. He said, well, I'm a law enforcement officer. And I'm thrilled. Marysville PD won't comment on the decision, but the city says Carlisle will return to the force on Friday as a fully commissioned armed officer and could be back on patrol. Our calls to Carlisle and his attorney were not returned. I was right next to it. Right ne I was five feet away. And I posted my address about that big time. And um, that's the most loving family I have ever met. And so my youth group, we went and got the paint. We spent a night in just making it. We decorated the barn as much as we could for that story. Um, I was diagnosed in April of 2011, and basically I was spotting for about a month and a half. And on April 17th, I passed a piece of tissue, which was about that big. Oh my goodness. And later I found out that, that was part of my tumor. And do you have a specific type of cervical yes. cancer? What I've got it? large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of the cervix. And that's pretty rare, right? Yeah. I'm one in five women in the world that have it. 
Would had this been at all? Oh my goodness, that's awful. Um, it, would you have known this from a pap test? Did you have a pap test? Um, I had a son um, back in January of 2010, mm -hmm. and I went in in March of 2010 for my pap smear. I came back abnormal cells with positive HPV. Went in, had a biopsy done, came back normal cells, no HPV. Told me to come back in a year, so. I was going to, but honestly, I wasn't going to because everything was fine. Right. Um, had I not been spotting, I still wasn't going to go in. It wasn't until I passed that piece of tissue that made me go in. And, you know, it's your pursuing of this, the fact that you didn't just blow this off mm -hmm. when something happened with your body that gave you a chance to get started on your oh, treatment. Yeah. What kind of treatment are you undergoing? Um, I'm currently doing chemo treatment right now. Um, I was clean and clear for three months and I found out in December that it had returned to my lungs. So so what happens now in terms of treatment? I, they're putting me on chemo to try and shrink the tumors, um, nodules actually, um, and it, there's no cure. I think of her as Jenny Bell because she was my student and it was heartbreaking and her daughter was in high school, and I think maybe that had something to do with it. And I think Jen was very popular with her daughter's friends, and so that was the reason she was commemorated. We are on top of a developing story out of Snohomish County where investigators are piecing together the moments leading up to a deadly single car crash in Stanwood. It happened around noon on Pioneer Highway near Norman Road. One person died, five others were hurt. Investigators told Cairo 7 a vehicle was heading westbound when it lost control, flew off the road and flipped. You can see part of the car there where it came to rest. Inside, six people. One person died and five others were transported from the scene by ambulance and helicopter. As investigators collected evidence near the crash site, other drivers were rerouted. Many left wondering what happened here. Camping gear was scattered across the road. Once the SUV was removed from the ditch, it was towed from the scene nearly five hours after the crash. First off, when you lose a child as a parent, you feel like a failure. And you ask yourself, what have you done wrong to get to this place? You know, no matter what you've done or how good of a parent you've been, you always are going to question, 
the woulda, coulda, shoulda. Is there something I could have went back in time and changed that would have affected, that would have bought me another? Maybe it was meant to be for that person to die and that was their time. But would that have bought me another year, three years, five years? You know what I mean? I do feel that things happen for a reason in our life, um, whether they're good, bad, whatever the case may be. And I just have, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around why the third time, you know, because you feel like I've already had my turn. It's not my turn. Please. I kept telling myself when I kept calling every hospital going, no, no, no. He's got to be at the other hospital. He's got to be. This can't be happening to me. This cannot be happening to me. It's like you're living a nightmare, you know, and that you're in this bad dream and that you just want to wake up and that none of this is really happening. I have a horrible feeling though that I'm going to be on this earth till I'm 99 and live through misery for many, many, many more years. But, um, <sighs> you can really bring yourself to a very low place in your life if you allow it. Um, and I'm not going to say that I don't have bad days because I do. With my daughter, my 18 year old, it just about killed me and put me in the grave. And I literally carried her death on my back for years. And it was about a year or two later where I crashed and burned. And that's why I told myself I was going to deal with my grief differently this time. So I decided that I wanted to be involved with the kids. I wanted to at least make an appearance and show them my gratitude and appreciation for what they were doing. An abandoned barn became a memorial today to a Camano Island teenager who died in a weekend car crash. 16-year-old Anthony Comstock was killed and five other teenage passengers were injured when their car flipped Sunday afternoon in Stanwood. Como Force Michelle Esteban is live to show us this unique memorial. Michelle? The news media lady as well was going to be out there. I really didn't want to run into her at that point. I mean, as you can imagine, you're not in your best condition. You know what I mean? I don't think that, I think I've forced myself to put on mascara maybe twice in the last year because it doesn't stay on, you know? When I saw my brother on the roof behind the news media lady, I knew we were probably going to have a problem because I'm sure it's not every time that people have gone out there that people have got up on the roof. And she was begging him to get off the roof, and he was like, no, 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 I want the airplanes to see Anthony's name, this, that, and the other thing. And then she goes into the real details of how that boy died. And I got to tell you, it was story after story after story after that of people coming forward and telling me as to why that structure was so important to them. The barn sits on a busy street near the heart of Stanwood. For 30 years, this old barn has been a wailing wall and a permanent memorial to lost loved ones. We're a really tight-knit community and we care about everyone that's here. By day's end, this wall will be covered in personal messages to Anthony. Neither of us have ever painted a barn for anyone and it sucks that it has to be for Anthony. For Anthony. Messages from his friends and classmates and a love letter from his mother. Investigators haven't revealed what caused the fatal crash. Pepper is one of the five teens who survived it. He says the driver lost control on a turn. Our back tire slid into the dirt and then she overcorrected it the other way and we just rolled. And I remember looking back and Anthony was screaming and I went to grab him and then it was just too late. Pepper says he'll never forget the moment just before the crash. And I turned around to look in the back seat and I told him I loved him. And he said, I love you too, bro. I had a blast this weekend. They've learned too young how death changes everything, but this barn will remind them that the memory of Anthony Comstock is forever. It's, it's a double-edged sword. You have this grief and you have this anger and this hurt and all these emotions that you're going through because you lost your child. But on the flip side of that, you drive out there and you see your child's name up on the barn and you're just like, wow, he left his mark on this earth. You know, people cared, they loved him. He left an impression.
I drove by it. Um, yeah, because then at that point, I made it a point to drive by it. Well, his name went up. He died on the 7th, and it was up in a matter of two or three days. And it stayed up until they took the barn down. David wanted to quit, and he was trying to quit. And and he had shared with me right before he had died um, about how he had had a great childhood. And he loved his family, and he really desperately wanted to get back with them. And they needed to hear that because they, they let him go. They said, we won't love you to death, and we can't watch you kill yourself. So you can't come back until you're clean.
know, we'd always talked, uh, you know, growing up about it wouldn't be fun, you know, to do something. But we're also not the, um, uh, that's a rebellious type, you know, to just go out and start painting people stuff. You know, we, we went about it the right way. We got permission from the owner during my bachelor party, actually, before I got married in the weeks leading up to, um, you know, when I got married in July of 07, my two best men, uh, you know, that was one of the things that they had earmarked, like that would be a, this would be a great time to do it. So they had set all that up and we decided that we're going to go out and, and paint something, right? We didn't have any idea what. So we got there and we had, you know, painted the backdrop on the barn itself to give us a, a platform. But we chose the the backside uh, facing opposite of the town uh, just because experience says that's going to be the lasting, the most longevity. So we painted it up on the backside uh, in hopes that whatever we would write would be uh, they're the longest possible and so we're talking about you know what to put there and I don't remember all of the different ideas that we had most of which were not you know very compelling or or, or funny or that matter so you know the, the question was posed kind of because it was my bachelor party kind of it came down to what what do I want to, to be there and so I thought about it for a time and what I came down to is I wanted to be something that uh, obviously knowing that it would be there as long as possible is the hope that there would be something that would be challenging, that thought-provoking, that it wouldn't be just a, you drive by and it's just another thing on the barn, but it would maybe uh, inspire somebody to take a closer look at what's going on in their own life. Spur somebody on to wake up. Yeah, I was going through some personal issues at that time. I was just going through a divorce and now living up on the lake permanently and I just happened to be going through the valley one day and the barn was there on this bright sunny day and I finally read an inscription on one side that said what will your story be and I got to tell you from that moment on it pulled me out of my own little personal pity party where I don't do pity parties well for myself or anybody else and I said what will your story be you know my, my story was was pretty darn good and I found it so inspirational and if anything I amped up my own life experiences. About a year later, a friend of mine took a picture of it, of that saying, framed it, and gave it to me for, for Christmas. So every day I have that picture literally in my living room in front of me, and it just reminds me, no matter how tough things are, life is a very temporary kind of place. The winter of 2013, I'm sitting in a, in a restaurant in Marysville after a wrestling uh, match. I'm a referee, and I was sitting there with an older referee, and we're just talking uh, about the whole real estate thing. Oh, Joe, you're a broker. How's everything going? I'm just letting them know. Yeah, everything's great. Just love the business. You meet a lot of people, and it, it's just a it's a it's a good feel type of business. So he wanted to get rid of a couple of rental properties that he's just been having problems with. He wants out of the real estate business. Hey, bring it on. Now the bartender, he reaches over and he says, hey, I want out of the rental business too. Boy, is that a bonus day for a real estate broker? I got to tell you that, that that'll make you a year right then and there. We we're out in Mount Vernon. He had another place out in Cedra Woolley, a place in Marysville. He says, but the place I really want to get rid of is this farm that I have in Stanwood. So I'm like, okay, hey, let's head on down to Stanwood. So it was like that snowy, rainy kind of day. And here it is about five o'clock in the afternoon. The sun is starting to go down. And where am I at? I'm at that barn. First of all, seriously, <laughs> I'm going to sell this place, okay, because nobody's going to touch this property with that structure on it. The liability alone for that structure of people trespassing there year after year after year, okay, was going to be a problem. Back at that time, I had to kick into more of a, a higher gear because it was right after one of the last kids passed away and they were starting to get up on the roof of this structure and painting the kid's name up on there. And that roof was in a state of collapse already. I could see, anyone could see, that that, that roof was about to cave in, possibly, on someone, some unsuspecting mourner that was going to be a hero to get up there and, and, and put you know this name as high on the barn as possible. You cannot use that roof. I'm surprised nobody fell through that roof. It's a miracle. Really, I could see me as a parent and a very paranoid, protective parent, when they were all in there, I was like, ah, uh, you know, because it's been there forever and um, it needed some help. I was concerned with when we were walking around, you have little kids in there, there's 
nails sticking up everywhere. Uh, there were a couple of close calls of my brothers falling off ladders. You know, it's scary when they're taking ladders and going 20, 30 feet up. I never heard of anyone getting hurt, which is interesting because I can just imagine, you know, they'd go out there in all kinds of weather. They'd be pouring down rain and they'd be out there painting the barn, you know. I mean, it was to the point that there's enough of tragedy on there, we didn't need any more. The only thing that was holding that, that place together was buckets of paint and buckets of tears. Uh, there was nothing we could do unless you had a whole lot of money. In the beginning, Joe Fatizi, he had the responsibility of what to do with this barn. He had the opportunity to, to see it burn, demolished, whatever. There were some parents who just wanted to see that place burn. And that was one of the options, by the way, was to use it as a practice facility for the fire department to burn it down. And I didn't want to see that, okay? I did not want to see that. Articles in the paper and, and of course, Facebook. There were a lot of people talking on Facebook about how the land was being sold. And, and with that, the barn was inevitably going to probably get torn down. So a lot of the calls that I got on that property throughout the year were people concerned about the barn. Okay, I had more calls, people just saying, hey, listen, if that barn has to go, call me. We need to do something about it to maybe move it someplace else. And I felt like it was a responsibility because I knew what it meant to me. I contacted Kelly Ruhoff, the editor of Stanwood Commando News. I said, Kelly, you know what? All these people were calling me and saying, hey, call me. If the thing has to go, well, this is that call. The barn has got to go. So what we did was we did a letter to the editor, and Kelly set up a, a community meeting held at the fire station. So I, you know, did my whole broker best suit and tie. I did all the little handouts. I took pictures of the structure, put together, you know, a whole nice little pamphlet of, of what we need to do, why it should be important to them, and only... Three people, include, well, four people, including Kelly, showed up. We thought that there would be a, a standing room only. Nobody from the city or, or a council member, mayor, or no one from the school district came forward to say, hey, yeah, we know what goes on here, and you're right, something needs to be done with it. Nobody showed up. It was really the students that really needed to come to that, and students were just not emotionally needy at that time. If there had been a death that had just happened, they would have probably been there in a second. We were at a point that I couldn't do anything anymore because, hey, nobody's coming forward. And I had one last shot, and that was with Dave Benick of Reuse Consulting. I called a place up in Mount Vernon that, that does recycling for different buildings, and they gave me Dave's name. I met Dave, I want to say, on a, on a Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon. And he's out there, and he's looking around, and he goes, you know what? If you want, I could save some of this stuff. I can save these two sides here that had all the inscriptions on it. I was like, great, what's it gonna cost? He says, maybe about five or six thousand bucks. Where before it was fourteen grand to demo the thing. Now we're down to only five or six thousand dollars. Listen, I can hustle five or six grand in my office. Okay? I know I can. This is a project that is so important to this community. So I'm at that point that I had a meeting set up on a Friday afternoon with one of my managers to talk about how we can raise some money to do this for the community. And a half an hour before that meeting, I get a call from Megan Watkins. And who's Megan Watkins? Wacky, um, unconventional, caring, unfiltered, kind, um, loud, stay-at-home mom, um, wannabe savior of the world. I, I sometimes have this overwhelming need to fix everything. I'd kind of like to leave here making things a little bit better than when I arrived. I think Megan has a big heart. I think she cares about this community. You know, I know she's been a mother, you know, she sees a lot of the things that everybody else sees. She's just one that won't be deterred. I think Stanwood has a lot of people like that, and I would describe Megan 
is one of those that wants a solution. And God bless her for being that way. I met Megan um, several times out there because she really was interested in saving the barn or buying the barn, relocating it, doing something she knew that it had to be done. I thought I could sneak out there and actually go and take pictures that nobody know. And there was that crazy blonde Megan chasing me down at the crack of dawn. She made it a point to introduce herself to me because she was signing paperwork on the barn and she had felt that it was through my son that she felt that connection and made that happen. But it was interesting because she signed the paperwork on his birthday. She's been so kind to me. Uh, we went to lunch. She expressed to me what was happening and, uh, and that um, it, there was efforts to preserve as much of the barn as possible. I was very happy to hear that. I, I think everybody probably thought like I did. Oh, well, somebody else will take care of it. Somebody else will, you know, we're all busy. And then I saw that only three people had gone to the meeting and that it looked like it was not going to happen. And she goes, you know what? I don't care what it costs. I'll pony up the money as long as we can save that structure and put it someplace else. I said, okay, let's do it. For years, we'd hear rumors, the farmer's gonna sell the property or, or the whoever the owner is of the property, the barn's gonna, gotta come down, it's gonna come down. I've heard it for years, so quasi believed it. Like, oh, it's coming down? I, I mean, I was kind of shocked a little bit just because, it, I mean, it's a landmark, it's been there, why would it ever come down? I, I was um, surprised. I mean, I, I don't think I was emotionally like wrapped up in, you know, it's the end of the world, this thing's coming down. But it was sad to, to see because, again, from all the different ways that um, that was an outlet for people. And also, selfishly, that, you know, the, the message that I put up there it would be coming down. Granted, it had already been painted over, but it was still there. This project really started to stand out, you know, the first time I saw it because I saw the potential of saving materials, helping the community, and, uh, and of course, the, the deeper meaning of the materials beyond just, oh, this is just another barn. This barn has a lot of meaning to it. The way I heard about it was I was driving to Stanwood and I saw it was being taken down and I called some people and I said, what's going on with the barn? But I felt very sad. I was surprised how sad I felt. So I had to come up with an approach to this building that might be different than other buildings because the idea wasn't really to take it apart, not completely apart, 
it was to weave it in big sections. Now these sections were, to put it in perspective, the size of a really large garage door, if you could kind of get an idea, or maybe a couple of really large garage doors. You know, they're not something, a big section of wall like that weighs, you know, could weigh 2,000 pounds or something like that. So, so we incorporated equipment into this. But the thing is, our equipment is, is used to surgically remove things and handle them, not to, not, to, not to break them up and destroy them. I came up with the term hybrid deconstruction. We use people and machines together to systematically disassemble a structure and to maximize reuse and recycling. The machines do what machines are good at, people do what people are good at. I held on to them and then surgically removed them and then carried them over off to the side where they would be later hauled away. Over the years, I've worked on 3,500 buildings. About 750 of those we've completely disassembled. This project had some challenges to it and a lot of it was that it was surrounded on three sides with a farmer's field and mud and dirt and I was thinking I'm going to sink down into this. I needed equipment to move these sections around and the equipment weighs a lot and it doesn't like driving around in farmer's field. So that was a that was a, a concern was how to get this building down in big sections when you really can't reach it very well. But when we save this wall we're not just trying to save as much of it as we can, we're literally trying to save it intact. And really, if not for nothing else, to honor the families, you know, that whose children's names are on that section, that we did the best we could. You know, as I was doing the project, uh, sometimes I found myself there without any uh, crew helping me at that time. Uh, there might be other people milling about, but I would be the only one physically working on the barn at that point. And I found that to be really, it, really a special time where I could focus on what I was doing, but why I was doing it, too. When they were deconstructing, I went and got several pictures. I saw a couple of older teens, maybe high school kids, and they were walking toward the barn and I was walking away and I said, oh, you're just in time, they're still, you know, whatever I told them, something about the process. And they said, okay, thanks. And later I thought, maybe that has different meaning to those kids than it does to me. Maybe they're upset it's coming down. Maybe that's one of their friends whose name is up there. Maybe that wasn't, maybe a perky lady with a, you know, oh, good for you, good timing. Maybe that really wasn't what they needed to hear. I looked at this project and I saw layer after layer of names of paint where they had put the names of these teenagers that had died tragically on the wall of this barn. And, and I knew that if I took the wall of that barn apart, the essence of those names would be lost, the parts would be scattered. So I really thought that by keeping the wall sections together, as did everyone else, Me Megan and, and Joe, they agreed 
that if we could somehow keep the wall sections together, it really is keeping those names together. I remember just feeling really sad it was coming down. I just, I didn't want it to come down. I thought it was done really well. It was done respectfully and almost lovingly. You know, there was definitely some pressure there. I think the pressure uh, mounted when, when the, you know, the, the, when the walls were, the big sections of walls were coming down and all the cameras were pointed and people were, uh, you know, watching from across the creek. There was definitely some pressure not to have something go wrong at that point because so many eyes were watching. Is this going to come down and in one piece? This is an old barn. It's been sitting up there for eons, and it's been through floods and snow, and Dave was very cautious and careful about how he took it down. But anything could have happened. I had the privilege of taking the barn down myself. When I was doing that, it generated a lot of interest from people driving by. I saw a lot of people <laughs> swerving in and out of lanes and so on as they tried to see what the heck was going on to this barn that they've known for decades, you know, as being the memorial barn. They knew something was happening, but they didn't know what it was. And we had 20 people stop over, you know, a period of five or six days that I was there. I would give them the brief description because I had a lot of work to do. So I had questions about, you know, is the material available because they wanted to buy a piece of it? I had questions about, you know, what was being saved versus what wasn't, or I had questions about why it had to come down. That was probably the number one question. Why does this barn have to come down? Because it's our memorial barn. There were a lot of tears, and, and there were some people there that had, had painted the barn a number of times, and I, I know it was really painful for them to see it come down, and that kind of added to the, the emotion.
a gentleman stopped by and asked all the standard questions. And then I asked him what his interest in the barn was, and he said that his, his son had died and he uh, and friends uh, painted on the barn. After I explained to him that it was a memorial and that, you know, that we weren't selling the materials, it was, we were trying to preserve this as much as we could for the memorial. And he asked if he could just have a piece of the barn because he, he wanted to give it to his wife, you know, as something that she could hold on to. I found a couple of nice little cedar barn boards that were really short and gave him those. I was driving by one day and it was gone. It was demolished. And seeing that, I was heartbroken. I'm still amazed at, at what he does. It's a tragedy that we destroy history far too often. Here's this man that goes around the country salvaging history. You know, it's been quite the journey from the first day that I set foot there as a professional, as in like I had a job to do on behalf of the owner, but actually having the accomplishment of actually saving the place was pretty powerful for me. As a matter of fact, uh, Kelly Ruhoff, the editor of the San Cabano News, she didn't think we'd ever pull it off. When those pieces were coming down, okay, and they were getting put to the side, and we're all sitting there with our Starbucks coffee and just watching uh, the fact that we were successful in doing something that I don't think a lot of other people would have thought possible. Yeah, you bet it was a good feeling. Oh yeah, very much so. It's, it's an opportunity to, to do a lot of good all at once, you know, uh, keeping things out of the landfill, saving resources, and then, you know, folks like the, the gentleman that stopped by, you know, giving him a piece of what he had in having his son, you know, a piece of that back, something to remember that experience by. Every memorial has a life. I mean, it won't, it is not something permanent. It will have a, a natural process of decay. And sometimes it may be something that we do or it may be um, nature. It just seemed like the time was right. Um, not easy, but right. There are a lot of people who I've spoken to who are glad that it's gone because it was kind of this curse, they thought. And even though I don't think it was a curse, I think it's necessary to the community. I could see that in a way. I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. I figured it was just good riddance. I think it should be a part of Stanwood's history, you know? It's just, it's been there as long as everything else in town, if not longer. I don't know, I just thought that they could have done something else. I think I read it on Facebook that Megan said, some kids think I burned the barn down. And so there was obviously some misunderstanding about what was going on. The people that took the time to read the articles and ask questions knew, knew exactly what was going on. The people that wanted to be cranky and find something to be angry about, found something to be angry about, and were misinformed. And there's always somebody like that. We turned the corner on Marine Drive and went, where's the barn? And I think both my wife and I were, there was that, oh my God, it's gone. And then what's going to happen? And then it was quickly that we were able to find, I believe that Megan purchased the barn with the idea of rebuilding it, which we thought was both just awesome. I did hear that it might be reconstructed. So that made me happy thinking that, oh, 
you know, it's not going to be destroyed. Yeah, it'll be saved. There has been a lot of support for me, you know, to, to get it back up. That that has been my driving force and, and kind of made me hopeful that I have not made an incredibly stupid mistake and, and I'm not going to hear about it for the rest of my life from my husband. Obviously, there, there, I recognize that some people are sensitive about the, the barn being used as a memorial. And so, yeah, that was one of my questions that I had for you guys, you know, was what side are you on? I thought it would be a good idea of taking the shingles and making plaques for the family members who had memorialized their family on the barn. So the idea was to uh, have a bonfire after we had the structure taken down, kind of as like a closure kind of thing for the community to come on out and just have a final moment, okay, to remember, first of all, their family, friends, just, just why that place, and it became a place for people to go. A closure to that barn and to kind of bring the kids together to kind of celebrate the, the people that, that had been memorialized on the barn. They, they needed to also understand that we weren't getting rid of it, okay? It's gonna be resurrected, <laughs> okay? It will be. I wanted to give them a face of, of the person that, that had purchased the barn and and allow them to you know come to me and ask me questions and see that I was an okay person so it was good to get that message out as well but also give them time to sit there and burn a whole bunch of pieces and talk about their friends and just as to why they're there and as to why they needed to just close maybe a chapter in their own lives to move forward. I've wondered with these recent deaths, um, they've found other ways to publicly mourn the, the recent um, deaths here in our community um, in public ways, but respectful ways. They haven't been graffitied. They're, they've been um, balloons and flowers and, 
and notes uh, left for the family uh, that the family put out at the end of their driveway for the kids to just write their heart out on great big pieces of paper. I think unfortunately now, our kids don't have a place to go that's safe. And I don't mean physically safe, I mean emotionally safe. If they go to the high school, we have to be there. We have to have administrators there. We have to have, have security people there. We have to infringe upon their pain. Not that we aren't experiencing our own pain, but we, you know, we're infringing, we're, we're stepping into their pain when they're there. They don't have that when we've we lost a student recently. They don't have anywhere they can go that they can release some of this. They can do something. Right after they took the barn down, um, actually our good friend, Nicole Wiebe died. Um, and she I was actually very close to her. And at the time, we were actually on bad terms. Uh, we didn't talk very much. And uh, when I heard she passed away, I immediately went to my friend, James Weaver. And I was, I've been friends with him since I moved here. And uh, he dated Nicole for a good two to three years. The idea was to start a concert for uh, the memorial service of Nicole Wiebe. And we were just planning to do something small. And then the other idea popped up to us is, well, the barn was tore down, and they're trying to get it back up, and Nicole's name is not being able to get on there. So we decided to come up with a memorial concert for the barn and the people that were on it, and the people that weren't be able to. It's, it's a lot more, it's more complicated than you think. Um, the name originally comes from, technically it's a uh, end of the world theme. Um, you know, in biblical terms they say, when the world ends it shall be perfect. And the end of the world is supposed to be at 11.55 p.m. just before the next day. So we thought, you know, if the world's perfect, it would be perfect by tomorrow as it ends. So that's where it came from. Then. You know, we were all like obsessed with the whole 2012 thing. So <laughs> the night of, we had a show, which was really cool, that we had a gig then. And then we kind of just waited for 11.55, we were just kind of sitting there. There's nothing happened. Um, my name is Jordan. Um, I'm, I started out uh, in drumline with these guys, and then I later on found Joe, and we, we all became a band together. We were, we just we just hung out a lot and then we just started putting stuff together for music and then it just slowly turned into this band. We added Turner and Justin. The idea of Ohana Fest was to remember the people for what they did and the positive vibrations they gave and the positive attitudes they gave to the world and celebrate their lives and instead of you know mourning on their deaths. We had the idea of going door to door to sell tickets and at first people were like no soliciting, close the door because they didn't even know what we're talking about. Um, but when we tell them this is for the memorial barn, 
And people are like, well, I'm going to buy a ticket. I might not show up. I might be busy, but I want to support this. So mm -hmm. the whole Memorial Barn thing really affected people. And, like, we really saw how much the community cared about the barn. Like, even if they don't go, they will donate money to help rebuild it. Yeah, there was a couple kids that they were like, oh, the barn's down. That sucks. But then, like, once they started realizing, oh, we're selling tickets for Ohana Fest to rebuild it, like, they were all like, oh, yeah, so the barn's not actually gone forever. It was a good thing. Yeah, I'll come and support it. With a positive outlook in your music, it can go throughout and create a positive vibe between everybody. And example, uh, at Ohana Fest, a lot of people there were not friends with each other, but everybody kind of showed up and had a good time together. And I saw people that normally don't talk to each other talking to each other. So I thought that was very cool. because it has been healing for me, and I can see firsthand how it's been healing for me, I think it's important for it to live on, which is why I want to be so involved with seeing it go back up with her and make sure that it can happen. Um, and if it can be done in other places, I really believe that we can do it here. I hope when it gets rebuilt, it has the same impact it did on everybody that was around when it was up. Um, I really hope it still has the same image I hope it's used for good. I would like to see the barn rebuilt the way it was. And I would like to see it in a location where everyone can see it and it's visible to the whole community. Um, if I had a say in it, I would prefer if the barn was more stable, probably more safer for liability reasons. But I think it's something that definitely needs to go back up. I think it'd be awesome. Probably wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be the same as the old days in the old barn, but still the tradition would go on. And even if they made a new tradition, you know, it, there's got to be something. I can imagine uh, it being um, a place where people can meet, maybe a place where there's seating, picnic tables, or um, maybe a little plaque that will give a little history of it. I can imagine something like that. It would be a city park. And actually, I'd, I've, I've talked to the, um, the, the granddaughter of the former owners, and she thinks it's a great idea. The, I, I don't know if she has a lot of say in it. The barn is so iconic, I don't think that it can be replaced even by itself. So if there were a resurrected memorial, I would say it it would need to be in a different form. There was a local artist that came uh, out as well that did sketches on what the memorial is going to look like. On one side, we want to keep the inspirational side, and on the other side, it's, it's going to be in memory to the kids that have already been inscribed on that structure so their families can come back out and put their names back up, and they'll have a place to go that they'll tell you that, that there's going to be another one. It's not like a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. I either contacted him or he contacted me, I can't remember. And uh, we met up for coffee so he can explain what was going on and he kind of introduced me to the story about how the barn was coming down because it had become a liability and that there were a lot of people connected to the barn that wanted to see it resurrected in some way in Stanwood and they needed sketches, ideas for what they wanted to do with the barn eventually, some sort of memorial. And so I told him that, yeah, I'd sketch up something for him. His idea was to basically recreate a barn. And I honestly, I don't even remember what my sketches were exactly, but I remember thinking maybe it'd be a little better if we didn't exactly recreate the barn, but we, you know, used these panels in an interesting artistic way, or we did it a little slightly different this way or that way. I think I gave him three different sketches. They were pretty rushed. 
And then after I had sketched them out, I just kind of had this nagging feeling like this isn't this isn't what should happen with this. If they want from this barn what it was before it was t torn down, they can't have that. You can't you can't you can't recreate that. People were going there and expressing themselves in that way because it was kind of this risky, you know, taboo kind of like that person meant so much to me that I'm going to risk this and do this grandiose act in response to show my, show my love or to show my sadness or whatever it was, or the camaraderie of coming and doing it together. And if you make this clean, nice, tidy little space and say, you know, like, it's like saying to a child, don't draw on the wall with those crayons. Here's a piece of paper. And they're like, ah, I don't want to draw anymore, you know? So I think the what the barn was, was important, but I don't think you can recreate it, you know? And I know that I did the sketches for it and everything, but what these people want to do is take this wood and rebuild it in a public space. And they don't have any, you know, civil engineering, engineering background at all. They don't have any installation artists on on their team, it would be a really, really long time before they could successfully do what they were describing. And it just sucks, sucks it dry. It just kind of sucks the spirit out of it. I mean, those are logistical things that have to happen for these things to work. But I just didn't want to get my spirit sucked out of me in the process. I'm not going to drive somewhere else to go look at it. <laughs> It's, you know, it's just that space will always house, house the events that occurred there. Just r resurrecting it somewhere else is just so false. And my story with the barn is, uh, is not about the grief. And so it's, it's, it's hard for me to, to, uh, connect with that aspect of it. And I know that's really what's fueling this project. So it's difficult for me to say, um, this is what I think you should do with it because there's a, there's a much more powerful influence that goes along with the passion and the grief that people are experiencing it. That's what their connection is to it. So because they're the catalysts for the project, you know, you, you, can, you can have input and you can make suggestions, but really the most powerful voice wins out and I think grief is a powerful thing, so. How do you manage that so that people still have the sense that they are doing something? Well, we don't have any fun now that they tore the, <laughs> tore the barn down. We just got to go do it the way they say, you know. I've worried that with taking down this barn and trying to put it uh, at, a, at a public place such as next to the park and ride here in Stanwood, that kids wouldn't use it, that it would be a permission thing. And, you know, they don't want a permission thing. They want to be bad. I would envision more something organically coming about. But I, yeah, I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think we can infringe on it. I don't think, I don't think adults can do it. It, it would take that first blanketing of paint. Yep. It would take the first one and then I wonder, I don't know, it'd be interesting. It would be cool if it would work. I don't think that the barn could ever be that again for youth. I think that it would be a memorial and more of a documentation of the history of the town. I think it would be in a said location and uh, more of some place you go and visit publicly. I think the time is over for it to be sneak in, do it, and do it how you want it, and hope that nobody dies again for quite a while. So your board will stay there, and nobody else's will have to be there. I think we're—I I believe we're past that. It was such an icon that there might have been some type of glorification to want to be 
a name on the barn. But I think in humanity, everyone kind of has that want to be needed and remembered and accepted, and we want to leave our mark. That's just a natural human instinct. I, I don't know that you can really say it will have a good impact, it will have a negative impact. It will have an impact. Way less harmful to people um, to write out your problems on a wall than bring a gun to school. So I feel that it's a better outlet for kids with issues to uh, kind of let their mind out on a wall. Write stuff that that would help that person, you know, and maybe in a negative way to let it out, you know. Write it out. Share it. Share how they feel. I mean, sure, it's negative, but it's good to be angry sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like that. I think that there has been a powerful shift in this community. Things that were once taboo, that you didn't talk about them outside of the family, now we are forced to look at it here. This new generation will not be silenced. They will not be muffled. And that to me is really hopeful and really healthy. One thing that we all have in common as as human beings is that we all will experience death that's inevitable so death and loss is what ties us together we all share in this brokenness that it is it's not we're not doing it alone this is this is community we are all broken a public memorial gives opportunity for dialogue it offers an opportunity to take action for for change that people can respond. This death has meaning if, if it can create a change. If you change even one life, one kid, if you do something that one kid looks at that structure that we're gonna to put together, and in some stupid moment, one night, all of a sudden that reminds them that I'm gonna make a different choice and not get in that car or not do this or not do that, that you save one kid's life, okay, you've done your job. Part of it is sitting in my my garage. The parts of it that we were able to to manage to to get out of the field. Um, the other parts that are are too big to move are still sitting in the field. Joe did talk to the owner, and he allowed us to keep the pieces of the barn back there until um, we can either get some decent weather and and get a truck back there to move it or um we find a place to to put the barn back up Two small-town moms are trying to raise awareness and a barn in hopes of helping their community heal. It is a story of life, death, and possibly resurrection in the farmlands of Snohomish County. King Fies Eric Wilkinson with a story. To me, that was a sign of their togetherness. It's interesting what brings a community together. Here in Stanwood, it's barnwood and nails. To me, it... Um is a landmark and represents Stanwood. For the better part of the past 50 years, people would paint this barn, announcing good times and bad. In recent years, it's been the place kids would go to memorialize friends who died too soon. And I'm one of those people that drove by it as well. 
and just like many other parents said, I don't want to ever see your name on there. Anthony Comstock's name was the last one painted on that old barn. Christy is his mom. Never did I ever dream in a million years that it was going to happen to me. Two years ago, the barn was taken apart for liability and safety reasons, but Megan Dasher Watkins wouldn't let it go. But I have lost three sisters. She brought much of the barn to her backyard. She calls it a love-hate relationship. Nobody wants to see their child's name on that barn, but it, it really was healing. Three more kids have died since the walls came down. Megan is raising money and wants the city of Stanwood to find a permanent place at this future park for the barn to be resurrected. I see these kids kind of scrambling to try and figure out how to grieve because they didn't have the barn. And, and that's hard to watch. Two moms who know the meaning of loss, who pray another family never feels their pain. But if one does, they hope these walls will help hold them up. Let's you know that you're not alone. In Stanwood, Eric Wilkinson, King 5 News. I think that like all other rituals that we have in our culture, that they are much more individualized and much more meaningful to the particular community. And I think this memorial here in Stanwood is, is representative of something that is very grassroots, that comes out of the people and has meaning directly for the people. I think that uh, what was important about the barn, number one, was tradition. I think that um, people had done it before them, and they watched that, and maybe they were too young to be involved in that, and um, now they got to do that. Now they, they got to express their grief. And it's universal, our need to grieve. We all have to grieve, and it's unhealthy to bottle it up. And there are a lot of things that give you reason to grieve. And maybe these kids were um, grieving for their loved one, their friend, but maybe they were grieving other things too. I don't know. And I guess maybe I, write, I wrote about it because I wanted it to be brought to people's attention that grieving is a part of life and you'll need to find outlets for your grief. Just an old barn. One of the art directives that I do with young people is to, I give them a large piece of paper and pastels or some kind of markers and I ask them to fill this space with shape and color representing who they are in, in whatever form they want and there's no right or wrong way to do it, just fill the space, give them a certain amount of time. Then I ask them to pass that paper on to the person who's sitting on their right. And I ask them then to destroy what was just handed to you. Rip it, tear it, stomp it, whatever you want to do, but destroy it. And give them a certain amount of time. Then I say, okay, now take that that you just destroyed and pass it on to the next person on your right. And then I ask them, with whatever materials are in this room, you can use anything you want. I want you to recreate what was just destroyed. Make it into whatever, whatever you want, whatever you feel moved to do. Use anything that's in the room. Again, giving them a certain amount of time. After that time has passed, I want you to pass it the, this to the person, the originator, the person who first began with it. And then we talk about what was that like to, to create something? What was that like to destroy something that belonged to someone else? What was that like to recreate? And what was that like to receive that piece back? This is what we're constantly doing in our lives, is creating things break down, destroy, sometimes Sometimes it's our choice, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's at the hands of someone else. But then there is always this option, this potential to recreate, that, that we are creative beings. That's what we do.